imagine five black guys with Afro and beers walking through the halls in, in a hospital with a five foot two Jewish white woman walking right into the intensive care unit, not stopping at the nurse's station, not saying we're here, but walking right up to the patient's bedside and being challenged on what's wrong with this patient. What is the heart rate? What is the medication they're receiving? What is the uh, side effects of it? What do you expect this medication to do? Listen to the long sounds. That is No that... one had ever done that. You are now part of the social experiment. <laughs> See, now where my limit is. Only got no oh, oh. Welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us today on the journey towards self-mastery. Our next guest was a member of Freedom House, the first paramedic team in the world. Freedom House was based in Pittsburgh and was ahead of its time. It was the first to start administering medicine and healthcare outside of the hospital setting. Our guest was the first person to ever intubate a patient outside of the hospital and has assisted in helping develop the books and training that would be provided for paramedics for decades to come. He retired as an assistant director of the Pittsburgh Bureau of Emergency Medical Services, where he organized the city's first diversity recruitment paramedic program. He also trained and mentored the first black chief paramedic in Pittsburgh history, Amira Gilchrist. He now aims to spread the legacy of Freedom House all over the world. Let's welcome today, Mr. John Moon to the program. John, it is an honor having you on the program, man. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. And uh, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor. Yes, sir. The pleasure is mine. Uh, do you prefer John or Mr. Moon? Uh, John is great. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. I got, got to clear that up. Man, I'm so excited to just have you here, man, because what happened was uh, I was listening to NPR like this was months and months ago and they did like a short little segment on Freedom House. And I'm like, maybe NPR, they don't have their facts together. Like, what are they talking about? Like the first paramedic team was black. Like we this would be in textbooks. We would know all of this. Like, why? why? You know, so I had to do my own research and and I found out it was true. And I'm like, wow, like this is crazy. And then. I saw interviews of you and, you know, I saw the book American Sirens. I'm like, wow, I got to I got to get John here, man. Like, you know, this this is fascinating because you're talking about a whole field that people just first off expect that I have spoken to people and they're like, wait, paramedics hasn't been around for like centuries. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, You know, like you would never imagine that it's such a new profession. And then also you would never imagine that this thing was, you know, head fronted by black black men. Like, you know, so definitely an honor, man. It's like talking to a superhero right now. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so um, I know people might not be kind of familiar with Freedom House. You know, I didn't know of it myself months ago, you know, until now. So would you mind sharing just how Freedom House got started, what it was, the purpose of it, and um, and how it became the world's first paramedic team? Well, that, that's a very interesting point because uh, I'll have to take you back uh, in time, uh, which was before paramedics, before 911, in an underserved, neglected neighborhood uh, called the Hill District of Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a predominantly black neighborhood. Uh, during that time in the 60s, uh, I would say racism was at an all-time high. Uh, African-Americans were were last on the totem pole as far as jobs and job training and things like that. And it wasn't necessarily in Pittsburgh. It was actually across the country. So the federal government decided to do something or try to impact that. So uh, they start funneling dollars into various neighborhoods that were impacted by uh, racism and neglect and, and underserved communities uh, to try and offset that. In doing that, uh, the respective communities uh, were required to kind of create different uh, formats uh, for job training and employment opportunities, voter registration, uh, educational situations for the individuals that hadn't got their high school uh, diploma and things like that. So you had one community center, perhaps in the city of Pittsburgh, that undertook that. And the community center itself was called Freedom House. And in Freedom House itself, it was actually a building 
in the community where people could go to uh, register to vote. They could go there to sign up for job training programs or look for employment. Believe it or not, that was even a, a, a mini food bank inside the structure uh, to uh, provide food to these uh, individuals that were uh, underserved and things like that. So as a part of that, there was a gentleman who was in charge of a foundation that gave money uh, to Freedom House. And his name was Phil Hallen. And he came up with the idea that if this community could deliver food and things to the residents of the Hill District, why can't they deliver medical care? Because the community itself had to rely on the, the, the police to get you back and forth to the, uh, not even back and forth, but to take you to the emergency room. So you're looking at a community that had a very adversarial uh, relationship with the police. So, and I'm not just trying to disparage law enforcement in any way, shape, or form, but picture you calling a seven-digit number. There was no 911 in the 60s, and they would send a police wagon with two, 99% of the chance it was white officers on there. Uh, They would come to your residence if they decided to show up or when they decided to show up or if they decided to take you because they had very minimal uh, medical training. So you really never knew what you were going to get. So if you can imagine two police officers putting you in the back of a paddy wagon on a canvas cot and both officers getting up front and driving you to the emergency room and you would lay back there until they got there. And if your heart stopped beating in route or you stopped breathing in route or any type of medical problem that can occur nowadays occurred in the back of that wagon and there was no one back there to help you, no one. So as a result of that, uh, people unfortunately were dying needlessly as a result of lack of medical care. So Phil Hallen who's a great friend of mine. He's 93 years old and we're still in contact today. He came up with this idea of this organization can drop off food. Why can't they deliver medical care? Because you had residents that couldn't make it to doctor's appointments if there were invalids and things like that. So uh, they couldn't get a cab to come to that neighborhood. Um, No other outside ambulance or something would come there. So you were really trapped in captivity in a particular community. So Phil came up with the idea that if we could get medical care to these people, then that would change the trajectory of what was happening. So they said, okay, well, that's a great idea, but we don't know how to do this. So Phil, he's the visionary. He says, well, let's check with the local hospital, which was Presbyterian Hospital at that time, And the hospital administrator put him in touch with a uh, gentleman by the name of Peter Saffer. He was the head of the Department of Critical Care Medicine and Anesthesiology Department. And for years, it was his goal, his vision, his dream to teach the world that it's not how fast you got the person to the emergency room, but what was being done for them before they got there. But no one would believe him. So... Up comes this organization with this idea, and they were put in contact with Peter Saffer, and he saw it as a golden opportunity to get his vision out into the world, out into the country. And he had to prove that you could take lay people with no medical training and teach them how to save someone's life. So Freedom House, with a a number of meetings, uh, talked to him and said, this is what we want to do for our community. He says, great. Um, And they said, we have one requirement. Every person that you train has to be black. And he said, okay. So they take 25 black men. And this was probably the most unusual group that you would ever think of. Uh, We were labeled as the least likely to succeed, hardcore unemployables, society's throwaways, uh, people that wouldn't amount to nothing by society standards. So Dr. Saffer takes these people and put them into a training program and train them to the most sophisticated way that had ever been done. 
not to provide care in the hospital, but to provide it outside of the hospital, at the person's home or on the street or in their job, wherever they would find them. So he trained them how to do CPR, how to um, look at a heart monitor and interpret what they call an EKG strip, how to transmit that back to the hospital, how to treat a patient that was critically injured in an automobile accident, how to um, assist a person that had trouble breathing or a drug overdose or a shooting, anything that could happen to a person outside of this outside of the hospital, they were trained to do. There was classes in in um, the emergency room and the intensive care units, uh, the operating room, uh, obstetrics uh, in delivering uh, babies, uh, even the, the morgue, uh, anatomy and physiology. Uh, we also spent time in, 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 in labs uh, practicing on, on, on dogs that had to be kept quiet because you, you're taking an animal. And so all of this training we had to go through in order to take that concept away from the hospital, away from the intensive care unit, away from the operating room, away from the emergency rooms, and take it out into the street uh, for the public. And it had never been done before. Man, that is so powerful. Um, and just for some context, I know people probably don't understand what the state was at that time in regards to nationwide. But, you know, they say you had a higher chance, especially in Pittsburgh, uh, of surviving, you know, a gunshot wound in, in Vietnam than surviving a car accident or a gunshot wound, you know, in Pittsburgh. So it's like this is like, you know, life changing for the world because this is unheard of, you know. And you're absolutely correct. And and it, it's it's not only in Pittsburgh, it's for every city across this country, because in Pittsburgh, this was the only thing that was prospering at that particular time. Uh, other cities were, you know, training individuals in a variety of different things. But uh, Freedom House merged with the local hospital. And this was what was born out of a vision of two people, Dr. Peter Saffer and Phil Howland to bring this to fruition. Yeah, that is so powerful, man. Um, now, before we get into your role with Freedom House, I want just to get a little understanding of your life, man, because I, I read American Sirens, man. And I was like, whoa, like, you know, um, man, I'm like, did this guy get therapy? Like, did he, like, this is heavy, man. So, uh, you know, you grew up in the Atlanta area during some really, really tough times, like no water, no electricity. Um, uh, life was rough, man. So, you know, walk us through, you know, your childhood, man, growing up in Atlanta. It it, it, it was by today's standards, probably, uh, I would say deplorable conditions by today's standards. But during that time, uh, it, it, I'm sorry to say it, it was the norm for, for blacks. Um, so, you didn't know that that was a better way of life. So growing up in, in, in Georgia or in Atlanta, it was a totally, totally segregated city. And it was the law. So there was no way around not being able to go to different stores and shop or not sitting in the front of the bus. There was no such thing as an integrated school. Um, and, 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 those were was the norm until you start getting protests and things later on in the sixties to offset that. But my situation was was one of of survival more so than anything. At that particular time, I didn't know because I was roughly about four or five years old. I had to deal with was normal for me, uh, uh, staying in a home that didn't have a, a, a indoor bathroom. Um, and, and, you know, it was customary to use a, an outhouse, uh, no electricity. So you used, uh, kerosene, uh, to light a light, a lamp. Um, you, you, um, heated the, the house by coal. So you put the coal into a, a pot belly stove and you got heat from there. Uh, there was no such thing as hot water, uh, at least not for me. Um, so you, you warm the water up on the stove 
and you put it in a tub, a metal big tin tub, and that's how you, you, you took your baths and things. So you cooked on the same stove that you used to heat the house. And, and, and that was the type of life that I had to survive in. And, and I wasn't upset about it or despondent or depressed or anything. Um, and if you add to that, uh, I, my mother, unfortunately, was an alcoholic. And during that time, uh, there was um, moonshine, so which was illegal, and 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 you know she uh, died from an overdose of, of moonshine. Uh, we were right there in the bed with her at the time. She, yeah, she uh, probably about four years old, and and so there's no such there was no such thing as 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 a coroner or an autopsy to determine the cause of death and investigate things like that. So the funeral home would come and get you and take you and embalm you. And that would be it. That one, you know, once that happened, you know, you, you, as a child, you, you go through that traumatic experience, but you move on, you plant that in the back of your mind and, and, and you move on. Not that you don't ever think about it, but, then I had to to deal with the issue of my father working and taking care of a sister who was two years old and me. There was no such thing as CYS, so he would go to work and leave us in the house. And, and we knew not to really, you know, get into stuff. Uh, and that was the norm. And and that went on for a number of years, but then it dawned on him that he it, it wasn't right for what he was doing, so he had to make what I would call a life changing decision, a life altering decision. He had to 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 decide to give up his kids to total strangers, people that he didn't know, didn't know anything about them, or, or anything. So from where I sit today, um, he made the ultimate sacrifice. And that sacrifice was to place his two kids in an orphanage for somebody else to take care of him because he wasn't able to do that. What happened to us? I mean, it, it was, you're talking about being a traumatic experience. We went there one day and, and he was, unbeknownst to us, he was making these arrangements. So we went outside to play with the other kids. Once he was done, we came in and we went back home and we went to a second time thinking that, wow, we're coming to play with all these kids and things like that. And he's going to take care of paperwork and whatever. So that's what happened. And we were out playing with the kids and then it dawned us, well, dad hasn't, no one's coming get us. Hasn't said, you know, it's time to go. So we went in and, said, where's our dad? And he was gone. Yeah. And we had to uh, adjust to being with probably 80 other children that that had no idea as to who their parents were. Um, and and that was a life that we lived for about seven or eight years. Not that we have never saw him again, because he would come by periodically to visit us. And during the summer, we would come and stay with him for about two to three weeks at a time, but then we would come back. And and th that orphanage, which is still in existence today, provided everything that you needed. We didn't have to worry about clothes, we didn't have to worry about food, we didn't have to worry about a place to sleep. But the one thing that we didn't get was the, the closeness of a parent. Uh, it wasn't like you would come home with, with all A's on your report card and said, mom or dad, look what I got. There was nobody to hug you, uh, nobody to kiss you as you went off to school. Um, so that was the life, not exclusively for myself and my sister, but for 80 other kids. And we all grew accustomed to that. And the one thing I learned about that is that kids are the most resilient people that you'd ever face in order to go through this. So I stayed there for about seven years until um, they notified me that he had died. And um, that was in probably 62. 
And so instead of someone hugging you and saying it's going to be okay, I was put in the room to grieve or to cry. So <laughs> I, I I sat in this room and for about a half hour, four or five minutes and cried and out. And life goes on. And unbeknownst to me at that time when he had died, that was a, a, a family in Pittsburgh that I didn't know I had. And they reached out uh, to the orphanage and inquired about us. They came to visit. One uh, mother came to visit who ended up being my mother um, and asked us, do we want to come stay with her? And she's, of course, we said, sure. So she made the arrangements to adopt us from this home. And we left Pittsburgh on a Greyhound bus uh, on the 24th of June, 1963, and arrived in Pittsburgh on the 27th of June, 1963. Three days. And, and that was an adjustment, too, because remember, we weren't accustomed to living in a family environment. And so uh, don't come over here and hug me because I'm not used to being hugged. Don't touch me because I had to. It, it wasn't like it was a mistrust. It was just I wasn't accustomed to living in a family environment. So that's probably the biggest adjustment. Then as, we, as you get older, you become combative and what you would call like most teenagers uh, do. Um, they don't listen and things. So. <laughs> Now, now at that time, did you get did you get any type of mental health like uh, therapy or um, did you have someone that you spoke to about what was happening like with your mental health? Well, that came later. That 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 came when um, I started acting out, and not that I was violent or anything. I just wouldn't listen. So uh, we had this family meeting. Doing this meeting, they were trying to come up with a reason as to <laughs> what was wrong with John. But probably today, they still have no idea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, in this meeting, I was sitting there and I could hear him, you know, talk. Well, should we try this? So my stepmother at that time explained to them what went on and what prompted her to come and get us out of the home. And as I'm sitting here talking to you, uh, I'm listening to them and come to find out that the rest of the family didn't want us there. So we were outsiders. I, you know, obviously, I didn't know that at the time. And, and it, it, was, it was a shock to me because the, the rest of the family kept telling her, and I can remember the four words, Mary, don't do it. She went head on and did it and brought us to Pittsburgh to live. But, you know, it was still an adjustment for us and them. But to find out that we weren't wanted there was even a more, you know, traumatic experience. And I, you know, rebelled on certain occasions. And, and then, you know, you had to deal with the favoritism of people that were born into the family. And, and for years, my sister and I were not son or daughter or stepson or stepdaughter. We were always the kids that Mary brought up from Georgia. So we had to wear that label. And whenever my stepbrother introduced me to some of his friends, this is the, the, the guy my mother brought up from Georgia, not my half brother, stepbrother, whatever. So I had to deal with that. And all, all during that time, unbeknownst to me, I was being groomed to withstand hurdles and barriers and 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 setbacks and disappointments and 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 broken promises and things like that. Didn't know it at the time. So all this time I was being groomed to withstand these types of things, to to never give up, to 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 break down the barriers and the hurdles that you may uh, come up against, because that's all a part of life. Yeah, that is a very empowering way of looking at it because uh, others might look at it completely differently. So I'm, I'm sure that that perspective helped you. Uh, so with Freedom House, you know, Freedom House is established. You're relatively pretty young. 
and their first day on the job is uh, after the assassination of Dr. King, you know, and they were out, you know, doing their thing in the black community. Um, and you, you know, at this point, you're becoming a little conscious and, you know, you're wearing your, your, your African wardrobe and speaking a little differently and this and that and the third. Um, what what was your take on, you know, what was happening during the assassina- assassination of Dr. King and what was the environment like at that point? Well, the environment itself was one of turmoil. Uh, even in, in, in schools, I was think I think I must have been in the eighth grade. No, I was probably in 1968. I was probably a senior by then. Uh, there was turmoil in the cities across the country as well as in Pittsburgh. So I played my role in, in the riots. I, I'm not going to stand here before 5,000 people and tell you what I did. Our imaginations will just yes, run wild. I, I, They'll I, run wild. <laughs> so I'll just say uh, I, I played my role and uh, I was out there doing the same thing <laughs> everybody else was. And 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 once things have had subsided, uh, I got a job in a hospital. And um, I, I, I worked there for about five years and, and things. So, uh, but during that time, I, I remember when I was at home and, and I made myself, I didn't make myself, I, I, I did a passionate plea, which was obviously a heartfelt plea to the Lord. And I said, Lord, if you ever let me get away from this, if you bring me through this, no one will, I will never have to depend on anybody again. So very shortly after that, I got a job. And then I started taking care of myself and started buying my own clothes and, and start looking like everybody else in the school because I had to wear the same thing back and forth to school every day. I had one shirt, one pair of pants, and when they split, I would take them home in the evening after school and sew them up and put them on the next day. So I became known as the person who wore the same thing to school when I was in the eighth eighth grade. And by the time I got to the ninth grade, I got a job. And the first thing I started doing was buying clothes like I saw everybody else because that's what I was missing. But, you know, once I got through that phase, then, you know, I, I started maturing and, and, and started uh, being more responsible. Believe it or not, in the back of my mind, that part of my life growing up, I was able to push it back there. I lived it, but it wasn't anything that I, I dwelled on. Uh, so, you know, really therapy and counseling and, and things like that were not part of my uh, repertoire uh, because I was in a survival mode at that time. Interesting. All right. So, you know, after that time, uh, you work in the Pittsburgh steel mills for a little bit, and then you realize that that lifestyle wasn't for you. And then uh, you find your way into the hospital as an orderly. You know, you're cleaning around the hospital, you're transferring patients, doing your thing with that. And then you see these black men with afros and um, they're, they're doing their thing. Like, And that was the beginning of your fascination with Freedom House. So walk us through that moment and how you transitioned yourself to be a part of that? Well, you know, you mentioned the steel mill. That there's, that there's a part of me that always says I can do better than what I'm doing. And when I went to the steel mill, my goal at that time was to get a white hat. And the white hat indicated that you were a foreman or supervisory personnel. So that was all part of me. Unbeknownst to me that people that looked like me had a very slim chance of getting that white hat. So I, you know, Went went to the hospital and got hired there as an orderly. And it was a, if you think of an orderly, it's one step up from housekeeping. So we made beds and we washed patients and we took them back and forth to therapy and we put the catheters in the mail patients and things like that. A lot of mundane stuff. So I'm doing this for about four or five years. And two guys, I walk into a patient's room that I was in to t- transport the patient home. And it was something about these two gentlemen. And today, I probably worked with them while I was at Freedom House, but I still don't know who they were. They commanded attention when they walked in the room. They didn't demand it. 
They commanded it because they, just their professionalism, the, the uniforms were crisp and clean. And like I said, they had afros and beards, so I could identify with that. They had a, 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 a portable radio that was saying something I had no idea what it was. So they take the patient and they leave, and I'm, I'm sitting there saying, wow, why can't I do that? So once I had lunch, I, I went, and you have to kind of picture this because I don't know whether you can or not. We had yellow pages back then, a phone book. And, and I went to the phone book and found out where these gentlemen came from. And they were at the hospital across the street. And I went there and went up on the uh, floor where the offices were and walked in and said, uh, I'd like to apply for a job. And I said, you know, hey, I'm an orderly. I bathe patients. I take them back and forth to therapy. I make their beds. I put in catheters and things. What, how difficult could this be? I'm ready. The guy says, well, okay, that's great. If I showed you a picture of the heart, would you be able to diagram the circulatory system, the route that the blood goes and, and stuff? And I said, no. Okay. If I showed you a picture of the lungs, would you be able to diagram the, the route where the oxygen goes the minute you breathe it into your your mouth and nose, where does it go from there? And name the labels, the different body parts. No. He says, okay, you're not qualified to work here. So I left and that little voice in the back of my mind kept saying, okay, John, you wanted that job. It's up to you to find out how to get it. So I went back to the Yellow Pages and found uh, a basic uh, EMT training program. And I went there and for 13 weeks, twice a, a week. And got past this course, got my uh, certificate of completion and went right back to Freedom House and got hired on the spot. I left their office and went right down to the uniform store and got those white uniforms that I had saw that day in the hospital. And, you know, as as they say, the rest is history. Um, so I still had an issue because I still had the job at the hospital. So I worked two jobs for about two years, um, and then I had to make a decision to let the hospital job go and work full-time at Freedom House. After I um, had gotten hired by Freedom House, I still had my job as an orderly at the hospital. So I worked 16 hours a day for two years, uh, eight hours at the hospital, and then left there and went across the street to Freedom House and worked there. So I worked from, say, 7 a.m. to midnight uh, for about two years. And then I had to make a decision that uh, that was what I wanted to do uh, and stay at Freedom House, and which I did. Uh, and uh, as truth be told, uh, that was my calling. And I had no idea at the time that it would uh, evolve into something uh, that it is today. So really, I owe a very deep debt of gratitude to the organization for, you know, taking, I, I guess you can call it taking a chance on someone that uh, just walked in off the street, but that was what they were accustomed to doing. So, but, you know, I, I stayed there uh, for about three and a half years and uh, until uh, Freedom House was absorbed by the city of Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services. Yeah, we, we're definitely going to get into that. Um, but I do want to get into uh, some of your experiences, Freedom House, man, like in the black community. Like, what are you seeing? I know like uh, the life of a medic, you know, the average person has no idea like what you're seeing and the things that you're going through on a regular daily basis. So you start working with Freedom House and this is your first time kind of really looking at some of these things. So what was the day in the life like um, at Freedom House? What were some of the things that you were getting calls for and dealing with? Well, probably I would have to say paramedics are, <clears throat> are different. Not all of them feel this way, but the, the more serious the call was, the better I felt because it, 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 it presented a challenge to me to uh, change what was happening to that person. So I always looked at it as a challenge. So 
each call I went to, it, it, it kind of was a challenge to me to get there and do the best I could to help this individual. Some of them were life-threatening situations, and, you know, not all of them were. But the ones that were, uh, I looked at it as a challenge to to do something that I otherwise uh, would not have been able to do, uh, primarily because of the training I'd gotten uh, while working at Freedom House. And, you know, it, it, it really was uh, a, a stepping stone uh, to my life to better, bigger and better things. Uh, some of the things we had to deal with um, were life-altering uh, for the patient and their families, but we also had to train the emergency rooms, have to get accustomed to seeing patients come in that were already taken care of. They were not accustomed to seeing that. They were not accustomed to seeing a person that came in with an IV already in their arm or or me coming in telling you what the person's lung sounds were or telling you what their heart rate was or telling you uh, what the heart monitor showed and, and giving you a past medical history with the medications and, and, and things like that. The emergency rooms were not accustomed to that. Um, I recall the first time I did that, went to a hospital and we had a, a young gentleman that had uh, passed out and something like that in the medical terminology just called a syncopal episode. So he passed out at work and we got there and we, we uh, worked on him. We started an IV on him. We looked at his uh, heart rate. We listened to his lung. We took his blood pressure. We gave our past medical history to the emergency room nurse and she laughed at me and I was very offended. You know, I didn't display that uh, with them, but, I went to the vehicle and and was talking to our medical director. Her name was Dr. Nancy Caroline. She was the one that wrote the book, Emergency Care in the Streets. Um, And I said, I don't, why are we doing this? No, you know, she didn't even listen to me. She told me, she said, if you don't learn to speak the language of the emergency room, no one will ever listen to you. Go back in there and find a doctor and do the same thing. So I did that and went back into the hospital and found a physician and explained it, talked to him on the terminology that he was used to listening to. And it was, you know, very well received. Uh, You have to keep in mind, too, the emergency rooms were not used to people like us coming in and giving them this high level of of patient care. They were not accustomed to that. Uh, You come in, you put the patient on a stretcher, you say they failed, and then you leave. No, we didn't do that. We told you why the patient fell and, and what we found out and their medical history and, and their vital signs and blood pressures and pulse and lung sounds and, and, and uh, even told them what the heart sounded like when it was beating. And so they, 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 they were not accustomed to that. So we had to teach them that be prepared. This is what's going to happen. Uh, the first tracheal intubation that was ever done outside of the hospital that I did. I got challenged by the doctor when I brought the patient to the emergency room. Who did this? I said, I did. And and you are? I'm John Moon. And who told you to do it? I said, I'm medical director, Dr. Nancy Caroline. And where are you from? I said, I'm from Freedom House Ambulance Service. And fortunately for me at that time, there was a nurse in the emergency room that knew or had been aware of us doing stuff like that. So she mentioned to the doctor, uh, oh, they're allowed to do that now. So imagine five black guys with Afro and beers walking through the halls in in a hospital with a five foot two Jewish white woman walking right into the intensive care unit, not stopping at the nurse's station, not saying we're here, but walking right up to the patient's bedside and being challenged on what's wrong with this patient. What is the heart rate? What is the medication they're receiving? What is the uh, side effects of it? What do you expect this medication to do? Listen to the long sounds. That is, no that, one had ever done that before. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. Mm-hmm. And I don't want, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, listeners to miss this moment because you made history at that point as being the first person to ever intubate somebody outside of the hospital setting. So, 
do you remember like who it was and what happened? And can you share that story with us? And before you got to the hospital, like what was going on? It was interesting because I, I had, I did it in the operating room of the hospital first. I walked into the operating room with the head of the critical care medicine anesthesiology department, because they're the ones that did that procedure. And when I opened the door, when they opened the door to let us in, I was standing there. Everything in that operating room stopped. The surgeon stopped talking. The nurse uh, stopped talking. The uh, or our technician, they stopped what they were doing. That was amphitheaters where medical students were looking down. Everybody stopped and they were looking at me standing in the doorway. And then it dawned on me, and I found out later, the only time they saw someone that come through that operating room that looked like me was with a mop and a bucket. But I didn't have that. So the head of the, I'm standing there with the head of the department. And we walk over and he tells the anesthesiologist that's sitting there at the head of the patient, get up. You sit down and intubate the patient. And I sat there. All these people were there, but I didn't see them. I knew they were there. So I went head on and intubated the patient on the first try. And we went from room to room to room doing that same procedure in an operating room. Little did I know at that time that less than a week later, I would take that same skill and take it out into the field and use it on a patient. Well, the person was unconscious. Uh, They were having trouble breathing. They were breathing, but they were having trouble breathing. So we called in to our medical director, Dr. Nancy Caroline, and said, we have this person that's unconscious. He's having trouble breathing. He has a a history of uh, chronic pulmonary obstructing disease. And these are his vital signs. And she said, intubate the patient and start an IV. At that time, I thought she had lost her mind. So (laughs) I asked her to repeat it. She says, intubate that patient and start an IV. So she couldn't see anything. Unbeknownst to me at that time, she she had gotten a report from the head of the department that proved that we could do that in the field. So she said, go ahead and do it. And then I did it and we transported the person to the emergency room. And that's when I got challenged by the doctor. And she came in after, you know, to, to confirm that it was done correctly. And once she did, I mean, she jumped for joy because I had already proved because she was writing the manual using our personnel that everything that paramedics do today, these guys can do. And they've already proved it. So therefore, it can become the national standard for every paramedic in this country. That is so powerful, man. Um, But that wasn't the only thing that you guys were revolutionizing and doing that is used today. So... Um, what what else was Freedom House doing that the paramedic industry, you know, just became a norm for everybody else? What what else was going on? Right now, and I, I love this example. This country is in an opioid crisis, and um, the drug of choice to treat that is Narcan. Everybody has Narcan. You can buy it over the counter now. It's this wonder drug to save. Uh, drug addicts' lives when they accidentally, and usually it's an accident when a person overdoses. Now they got this wonder drug out there. Everybody has it. The addicts themselves have it. But what people don't realize is that Freedom House administered Narcan back in 1973. So it's not new. We were the first to take it out of the hospital setting, out of the emergency room, out of the operating room to reverse the effects of narcotic overdoses. And and it's it's interesting because the, not, the drug overdoses we had didn't wake up in the back of our trucks. We didn't want them to wake up. Did not want you to wake up because we knew that once you woke up, you would either become combative, you want to jump out of the truck, or fight the person that spoiled your $25 high. So we kept you in a confused day state by slowly administering this drug through an IV bag. We didn't just stick it in the arm or the leg or whatever. We gradually gave it to you. That is so fascinating because um, I've actually followed the the opioid crisis and comparing and contrasting, like, you know, the way that uh, these white individuals are being treated with respect and dignity and 
everything versus how it was for black people that was going through the same thing at the same time. And then when I looked at uh, Narcan, it was like, wow, this, this is like this amazing drug. And people were like, you got to invest in Narcan. This is, this is it. This is the, and looking at Freedom House to be like, yo, these guys were using this in the early seventies. Like they, they already like, man, I was like, wow, this is fascinating that they can kind of promote this as this wonder new drug. And this is what we doing but not even mention the name of Freedom House, not even say like, this is where we got it from. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating, man, just seeing yeah, the, the and, differences. And it's amazing to me, even though I was part of it, it boggles my mind today how far ahead of our time we were. Yeah, I'm still in awe of some of the things that we did back then and that they're still doing today 50 plus years ago. Indeed. I mean, everything, yeah. everything. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So so we cannot definitely talk about this period in time without talking about the racism that you guys had to maneuver through. Um, and reading American Sirens, I'm like, I, I like wonder how these guys kind of maneuver through this without being angry and how they stayed clear minded because you're dealing with racism in the hospital setting. When you bring in the patients to the hospital from the, from the, uh, the nurses and the doctors that's telling you to go grab a bucket, thinking that you're to help, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you're dealing with racism from, uh, the patients saying, don't touch me. And I don't want, you know, any hands on me and get away from me. And they're dying. They're like, <laughs> like yeah. they don't want you to do anything. You know, um, you're dealing with racism from the police, you know, like all around racism. So can you talk about some of those experiences and how you guys were able to kind of maneuver through that and still do your job? Like, I think that's the epitome of black excellence right there. And, and, and that's an interesting point, primarily because we never actually allowed that to cloud our thinking. Um, and, and I like to use the, the, the terminology that we were living in the moment. So if I would come to your home or job or whatever the case was, and you didn't want me to touch you because of the color of my skin, which would have been the case, then I had to use a psychological ploy, if you will, to change your trajectory of thinking. So I would tell you, okay, if I don't do what I'm trained to do, and and you don't want me to do it, then the chances of you arriving to the hospital in good condition or even alive are dwindling all because you are making a decision to not allow me to do it. So are you willing to take that chance that you don't want me to uh, give you this medication or or undress you to put uh, electrodes on your chest to monitor your heart rate? Uh, you, are you willing to take that chance? Because if something's happening to your heart and I can't see it to fix it, then you're, you're, you're putting your own health at risk. So, so, so we had to use a, a, a psychological ploy. Now, with the police, it was somewhat <clears throat> different, primarily because you're, you're, you're often dealing with uh, 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 a white guy with a gun and a badge and a nightstick. So you you really didn't have your options were very limited during those circumstances. So at Freedom House, we discovered that the police were not giving us the calls that we were should have been getting in our neighborhoods. So we devised a, a scheme. We bought a police scanner and we monitored the police calls. And when a call came in in our district that we didn't get and they're sending a police, we self-dispatched, which simply means we jumped on the call and oftentimes beat the police there, treated the patient, and passed the police on the way to the hospital while they were still going to the residence. And that became, you know, the norm. Uh, In addition to that, once the police discovered how good we were, they started requesting us. Uh, there was a uh, incident in uh, an affluent neighborhood where a child was struck by a bus and the police arrived on the scene and the, the, the injuries were very traumatic for them. And, and they obviously didn't know what to do. So they called back to the dispatcher and said, 
send Freedom House. And the dispatcher says, I can't send them because that's not their district. And the police said, okay, well, you better send somebody out here to knows what the hell they're doing. Once again, we're monitoring the police radio. So we subsequently dispatched ourselves to the call and got there and treated the person and, and transported them to the emergency room. So, you know, <clears throat> those are some of the, the, the hurdles and barriers that, that, that we had to, to overcome. And on top of that, the, the, the political arena reared its ugly head. And when, when, when I look at Freedom House, I often think that we were victims of our own success. Yes, yes. Speaking of that, speaking of political, you just, uh, they, they, they had, you guys had a mayor um, that made some very interesting, questionable decisions um, and felt a certain way about Freedom House. So you guys proved that you were successful because uh, the survival rate for Black people in Pittsburgh was higher than the survival rate for white people in, in Pittsburgh. communities outside. Yeah. Right. You're so they're like, they're like, so, okay, yeah. this is working. Uh-huh. But the mayor and, and, is like, we don't need Freedom House. Like, yes. let's just get the officers to do it. Like, yes. You know You're what I'm saying? You're absolutely correct. So he, but, get, he takes, he takes uh, $100,000 and turns it into $50,000. You know, I think they said there was a higher, um, there was, they were paid, the city was paying more for dog catchers. <laughs> dog catching <laughs> services than they were for Freedom House. So you got, you know, your car, your, the vehicles, the trucks are breaking down, um, engines are, are heating up and you don't have any brakes. Like, um, I can't even imagine like dealing with an emergency call and you thinking like, yo, this car can go on fire right now. <laughs> like, cause... Well, you, you're, you're absolutely correct. And one of the, the, the drawbacks with that is that he didn't have control over this organization. And as a result of that, you had a underserved, neglected community getting better medical care than your affluent communities. So they, in turn, voiced their displeasure. How dare you allow those Black welfare people over there in that neighborhood, that rundown neighborhood, getting better medical care than I do, and I voted for you. I contributed to your campaign. I I, I own this business. I own this $500,000 mansion over here. The nerve of you. So he had to bow to the wishes of his constituents. So but at that time, he didn't know how to get rid of Freedom House. So, and 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 as I'm sitting here talking to you, <clears throat> I want you to, and anyone else that's listening, this is very, it's controversial. There's pushback from what I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out to you as I'm sitting here talking to you. Because what he did is... He issued a memorandum to Freedom House that says when you go into the business district, you are not allowed to use your red lights and sirens. So can you imagine you calling for a heart attack and Freedom House is dispatched to the business district downtown Pittsburgh and they have to stop for the light, wait for it to change, move to the next light. And that impacted response times. The next thing happened is we had a contract with the city of Pittsburgh to provide medical service to the business district and say it was fifty or $100,000. And we depended on that for payroll, for maintenance of the vehicles and things like that. So maybe January 1st, we expected $100,000 from the city or 50000 and we get 10000 Maybe six months later, there's another 10000 Two months later, a 5000 so those are the types of things that impacted the survival of Freedom House. Hmm. That is that is fascinating. So not only that, but they they they're making you guys test and test and test in order to keep your jobs now. Like I this this to me is diabolical because this is like a plan of how do we get rid of Freedom House, you know? So people are losing their jobs because they're not passing the test, you know? And 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 you're absolutely correct. 
uh, what what happened during that time frame is we the the management of Freedom House submitted a recommendation to the mayor that says this is how you can expand EMS system across the city, a written document. So he says, okay, take it and put it on my desk and I'll let somebody look at it. Unbeknownst to us, behind the scenes, he was already designing and changing, starting his own EMS system. So he took that man, that document, that manuscript, and used it to implement Pittsburgh EMS. And it's still in operation today. We wrote the book that you had to read to learn how to do it. Yeah, and then they, they brought in these white men that you guys thought brought, were going to be... a white organization from yeah. the suburbs. And you thought it was going to be an expansion of Freedom House, and these were the trained replacements. Right. They were, they were, they were the replacements. Fascinating. Fascinating. So, so the mayor, you know, kind of implements all this stuff, and then this is like the transition from Freedom House uh, not existing anymore, pretty much. So we're talking about eight years, 5,000 runs, thousands of lives saved. And, you know, none of this is a factor anymore. And people at Freedom House like that were saving lives before and doing all this work. Now they're back on the streets. They're looking for work. They're driving cabs. They're doing all type of other stuff. You did have some people that, that continued within the profession, but we'll, we'll get into that. But when I was listening to that uh, or reading it um, through American Sirens, I'm thinking about, well, wait a minute. You know, Dr. Dr. Saff is the one that, that that started all this. And this is his his baby here. And, you know, he's now world renowned and he's working with the White House to get this thing across the whole nation. And he's going to Germany and getting it there and everywhere. So you're telling me Dr. Saff does not have the power to save Freedom House and he does not have the power to make sure that these black men that he started with get employment um in in work somewhere as a as you know a paramedic and they started this whole thing so i had some trouble kind of figuring out like how did dr saffron not intervene and assist uh these members of freedom house uh find employment get a job and 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 maintain the the amazing work that they were doing well what you have to keep in mind number 1 is you're working in a political environment and politics whether people realize is a, is a, is a dirty game. It wasn't that he didn't try because he did. It wasn't that the medical director didn't try because she did. But <clears throat> what, what you, you, you're dealing with is the ugliness of politics. So you, you, you add politics and you add racism to it and you come up with a, a, a very convoluted process. So Freedom House entered into an agreement with the city of Pittsburgh. The agreement said, you take the vehicles, you take the equipment, you take the people. They are not to go through any additional training because they're already trained. So the agreement was already in place. It was written. The agreement said <clears throat> that I had to take you. It didn't say I had to keep you. So the department devised a systematic way of eliminating as many of Freedom House's employees as humanly possible through the testing and, and the shift changing and, and not being allowed to do uh, anything. Um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a prime example because you're looking at the very first person to put in a, a tracheal intubation in the streets. In this country, I wasn't allowed to do anything. Yes, yes, I wasn't allowed to do anything. Anything we could do to frustrate you to say, okay, y'all got this. I don't need this aggravation. And it was very successful. And the reason behind that is if you get rid of the people that made history, you essentially get rid of the history that they made. So it was a calculated type of process. Of course, no one's going to own up to that. No one's going to say, you're absolutely right. But the document speaks for itself. And uh, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm speaking to you from personal experience, where 
I went on a call with a crew because I wasn't allowed to talk on the radio. I wasn't allowed to drive the truck. I wasn't allowed to examine patients. I was the third person on the crew. I was an observer. We'll go in a patient's home. The person is unconscious, not breathing, and their heart is not beating. The crew I was working with didn't know what to do. They panicked. So they turned around and looked at the person that wasn't allowed to do anything and say, you take over. So I assigned duties to the crew members and told them what to do and stuff like that. And we subsequently saved the person's life. And that's great. But it had to be kept quiet because I wasn't allowed to do anything. And from that point on, I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision to step up my game. I had to be more vocal, more outspoken, more determined to let people, the department, know who John Moon was at that particular time. And I kind of devoted the remaining part of my career to doing that. So when I hear people say I've never heard of Freedom House, despite the fact that I'm disappointed and I'm saddened by it, I know the reason behind it. And I know it was part of an intended purpose to make sure that happened. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, reading American Sirens, I'm like, so yeah, yeah, you're creating history. You're aware of this and you've gained all this confidence from saving so many lives and doing these things. You know, you said the more dangerous, the more confidence you felt. And now you get into this group and they're like, hey, hold it back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like what? You know, so what? What I know a lot of uh, other Freedom House members kind of like they probably quit and decided to just leave it alone. Like what made you stay and, and fight this battle? Well, <clears throat> it's a couple of things. Once I, I was able to figure out that the intent was to get rid of me, it was up to me by, by, by simply trying to prove to me that I couldn't do the job. It was up to me to change your mindset. So I went on this, this mission that I wanted you to know that I was better than you. That was my goal. And, and you know, you're not going to come in here and tell me that I can't do what I'm, I love doing at this point in time. So I, I kind of made that my, my, my overall focus. And, and as I worked there, I looked at, the makeup of the department, which continually became steadily white as I was there. So I made myself a promise that if I ever got into a position to make a change in a department, I would devote the remaining part of my career to do that. So I had to find a way to start elevating myself up through the ranks and get promoted. And I do that by simply job performance and, and uh, being outspoken and, 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 challenging different situations with, with people that were in charge of what I was doing. And so I, I that started to work. But at the time, I said, you know, John, you're going up the ranks, but there's nobody coming behind you. So I challenged the department on its hiring practices because Pittsburgh EMS, it went 10 years without hiring an African-American. So I challenged the department on that. And 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 the person in charge, by the way, was somebody that <clears throat> you trained. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So he knew what it felt like to be a minority. Yeah. So I challenged the department. And fortunately, he knew that I had precepted him. So it's sort of like he was beholden to me. So he said, okay, well, I, I I agree with you. So you come up with a plan and 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 I'll I'll deal with the politics of it. So I came up with the plan and de designed it and and he dealt with the backroom politics of, of moving money from point A to point B and stuff like that and, and the opposition to it and 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 it became the normal way of Pittsburgh. EMS to hire people. We, once I started that program, there was never a class where it was all white. Yeah. And I used the same format that, that Freedom House used. 
went out into the community and recruited people that had no idea what a paramedic was or an EMT, or perhaps they'd never seen one, put them into a training program, paid them a salary to, to train. And once they were finished their training, I was able to get the department to hold job positions open. So it was just a smooth transition uh, into the department because the department had invested all this money into these individuals. And, and it, it, some of them are still there today. And I started this program back in 1990. That is powerful. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about the oil list and I'm thinking about this is the person that is your boss is somebody that you trained at Freedom House that was trained under you. And, you know, eventually you retired as assistant chief paramedic, you know, of, of your department. Um, but you, do you ever think about like, was my potential maximized as um, a paramedic and the work that I was doing? Um so looking back, do you feel like your potential was maximized when you look at people that you trained, that you had more knowledge than, and they were in higher positions than you? I even do that today, but I can accept it a whole lot more because as, as I was busy out recruiting, trying to diversify the department, unbeknownst to me, I was sabotaging my own career because as positions started opening up, the, the, the department had a policy, the next man up, because you had already gotten the experience of, of dealing with it. So you were, you know, one position prepared you to deal with the next one until it was time for John Moon to move up to the next position. They changed the promotional process. I was passed over for the assistant chief position by a white male that I'd been his boss for 15 years. So I challenged the department on that. And and it said, okay, well, we don't have any reason not to promote him, so let's give him the title. So I got the title of assistant chief, but the guy that got promoted over me, he got an eight thousand dollar pay raise <laughs> than, than I did. So he's making it. Plus, they took all of my duties away from me and gave them to him. I had ran Pittsburgh EMS for 15 years. Everything in that department went through John Moon. Promotions, hirings, terminations, suspensions. That is fascinating, man. I'm, 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 not, I'm not surprised at all. Um, that just shows you just the power of the work that you guys were doing. And, um, and it makes me think, right, if we reconfigure this story, and Freedom House is a group of 25 white men serving the Pittsburgh white community and do, you know, they, they do all this groundbreaking work. Does the story end the same? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and that's, that's my motivator that you're right. That's, that's my motivator. Um, primarily because the, the makeup and oftentimes we can kid ourselves. But the makeup of the department played a major, major role in its survival. Um, so, you know, there are people today that are working for Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services that have never heard of Freedom House. I want to change that. And, and one of the ways I changed that is that when I look back at the hurdles and the broken promises and the disappointments and things that we all had to deal with while working at Freedom House. I look at the individuals who, who refused to allow their past to determine their future, uh, who, who decided to rise above it in spite of it. Um, and, and when I look at that makeup and I look at those hurdles and things, and then I look and see that Pittsburgh EMS has its first African-American chief after 48 years, then I can turn around and say it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody that I hired 25, 26 years ago. So John Moon is still involved in Pittsburgh EMS, whether you want him to be or not. Man, that is, 
I'm, I'm just so inspired by by you, man. You're like a superhero to me right now. Um, just the amazing work that you've done. And by the way, I think if if it was 25 white men in the white community, they wouldn't even go through EMT um, training without you know the first thing, first page. They mm-hmm. might be in the cover of the textbooks. <laughs> like, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Um, every kid in in this country would know and understand that this was started by these guys, and this is how the story went. And they would have had monuments in Pittsburgh and and statues and you know the whole nine, the whole nine. You know, so it's fascinating, man. And that, um, you know, and that's true. That those are the things that motivate me because. Uh, as I've said, the paramedic training manual that every paramedic in the United States was required to read in order to become a paramedic was written by the people at Freedom House. In the first, maybe first, second, or third edition of that book, it gives its credence to Freedom House. But as more editions are printed, Freedom House is removed from any importance in the manual, despite the fact that we wrote it. Credibility is given to Miami and Jacksonville and Seattle and Los Angeles, how great those services are. And then as a sidebar, there's a paragraph that said, Freedom House, a group of black men that didn't have an opportunity to get a high school education. That's all. But we wrote the book. Everything in that book, we had to prove that you were able to do it. So those those are the types of things that 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 motivate me to say no 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 this is what it is this is how it began this is so i have yet to to write the editor of emergency care in the streets and tell him you got it all wrong freedom house was not a group of black men that didn't have a high school education i went on to become assistant chief of pittsburgh ems there was a, a another paramedic uh, mitchell brown who became who went to cleveland and designed their EMS system from the ground up. He became public safety director for the state of Ohio. He became public safety director for Columbus, Ohio, EMS commissioner. So he's still grouped into that classification of people that didn't have an opportunity to get a high school education. So the label that society put there, we had to deal with. But as I look back on it, I often say society made one mistake. It didn't tell us. So we went about servicing an underserved, neglected community with the best possible pre-hospital care anywhere in this country. Man, and and it it begs the question, like, what do you think would be the impact to the Black community if Freedom House was allowed to continue and expand? Well, it, it, it would... It would make sure that diversity was of impetus, very important, because unfortunately right now, and, and I, I use Pittsburgh EMS, but it's, it's, it's nationwide, that diversity is, is, is terrible. It's very dismal. Um, Pittsburgh EMS, unfortunately, um, has a 3% African-American rate, despite the fact that Blacks started it. So... Right now, um, the chief of Pittsburgh EMS is working very diligently to change the trajectory of the diversity in the department. Uh, when I was there, I was a person, I was the lead person that impacted there. I, I dealt with all the oppositions and all that did was motivate me to try harder. I, I dealt with my name being carved in bathroom walls in the emergency room with racist statements and, and things like that. Uh, so I, I fought with the paramedics union and, and, and so my goal was to diversify the department and, and, you know, I, it was, it was very successful because once I left, it went back to its own, let's do what's popular rather than do what's right. Man, I think, uh, this, this just states the importance of, you know, black history and learning these things because, um. You know, I have a friend who who uh, went to paramedic uh, training and worked, you know, for six months, you know, uh, as a, a volunteer. And he looked around. There were no other, you know, black people around. And he, you know, he was struggling and he ended up, you know, transitioning into another career field. Now, imagine if he understood and knew about Freedom House, like, 
you know, and I think these stories are so important for our kids to have an understanding that this happened and to envision there's space in something where there's not, you know, you mentioned Pittsburgh's 3% nationwide. It's about 6%, you know, of black people that, that get hired as, as emergency technicians. And, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating, man. So when we look at the legacy of Freedom House, you're a big put, you're a big part in, 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 in the, uh, creating that legacy and establishing that legacy going forward. So what do you want people to know and understand about Freedom House and the work that was done? I, I, I really want them to understand where the foundation of EMS that we take for granted today, that's glorified on television. Uh, my goal is to ensure that in every EMT class around this country, in every paramedic class around this country, and every EMS physician's training program, because that's a specialty too, the history of EMS is included as part of that training. And only until we are able to accomplish that, then the fight will continue on because there's no way for, you know, the, the history to be imparted in the, in, into the classes themselves. Um, right now, I'm, I'm still embarking on a push with the chief to get Freedom House's emblems on every one of Pittsburgh EMS's trucks. There's a few that have them on there now, and it's something I did when I was there. But, you know, once you leave, we go back to our own ways and things like that. So I'm, I'm embarking on that venture, too. So uh, I have her ear. And and uh, we'll get it done. It's just that, uh, you know, I need platforms such as this and, and uh, you know, NPR and all the other uh, – programs out there to, to keep this part of, of history alive. And that, and that's why I can openly tell you just being here talking to you today is, is fulfilling the desires of my heart. And that's to make sure nobody forgets about freedom. Indeed, man. Uh, definitely means more to me, man. Like I said, I'm talking to a superhero right now and it's, it's amazing. Like these are the, the images that our kids need um, when we talk about Black History Month and what black people were able to do and and fight for. You know, um, obviously some of the things we went through are important, but we need to know some of the people that established things and were in the forefront that are still alive and still doing the work. I think that's super important. And that is exactly what you are representing. So I think about too, like, what is the legacy that John Moon wants to leave behind? You know? What I want people to understand, even though uh, you're talking to me uh, and I'm the one that's traveling around the country and, and the book signings and all this other stuff, that it's not about me. It's it's about a, a organization that represented a prime example of perseverance, determination, and resiliency to create systems that are, are in existence today. Uh, I'm not trying to create a legacy for myself so much as I'm trying to make sure this legacy to Freedom House left remains in the forefront. I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> But uh, obviously, uh, you know, you're the first person ever to intubate a patient outside the hospital setting that will never be forgotten and it should never be forgotten. And I hope that, you know, as they continue to make these textbooks and Freedom House's name continues to be out there that that is mentioned in the textbooks and, uh, you know, the work that you, you, you've you done, um, you know, getting uh, black people in this field is mentioned in this textbook and, you know, the work you're doing right now to keep Freedom House's name alive is mentioned. And these, these are the things that we need to know about, I think, and and that that create a sense of esteem, you know, proud like that. These men, you know, withstood the worst racism, you know, on that you can experience from from everybody and did their job to the maximum of their capabilities and save lives like it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Moon, I appreciate your time, man. Um, I definitely owe you lunch and, and, and dinner somewhere, man, sometime when you, you come to New York. And, um, you know, it's definitely been an honor speaking with you. And uh, hopefully we can continue uh, chatting because I think the work you're doing is important. It, it's definitely important. And uh, I've made myself a commitment to continue it. 
So that's why I, I, I really can't thank you enough for this opportunity uh, to, to, you know, be on your uh, podcast. And, and, you know, once I get to New York, I will look you up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, we, will, we will talk after the program. Um, can you do us one more favor, Mr. Moon? Can you leave us with your favorite quote and what it means to you? And we'll leave off on that. Well, um, my favorite quote really, as far as it's kept, is that you have to rise above your obstacles and barriers and hurdles um, because those are all part of life. And um, if you keep that goal in mind that you're shooting for, uh, determination, resiliency, and motivation will get you through it. That is deep, man. That is deep, man. Uh, man, thank you so much, man. Um, definitely anytime I hear somebody say, man, we gonna, it's, it's hard out here, man. This is tough times. And I'm like, man, you better check out Freedom House, man, and what they was doing, man, like talking about tough times, man. So thank you for, for giving us some inspiration, man, and uh, these stories that we would have never gotten without, you know, your powerful words and, you know, the people that are covering this. And uh, listeners, definitely check out Freedom House. Uh, there's a book, American Sirens, uh, that you should check out. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Moon is like heavy, heavily mentioned in that book. And uh, <laughs> you're the star of that book, man. And uh, there are documentaries out there that you can check out as well. Um, and, you know, where, where, where can people find you too, Mr. Moon? Like people that, that uh, might want you to speak to their schools or if, wherever if, else. If, if they go on LinkedIn, um, I'm, I'm, you know, readily available on LinkedIn. If they, I, you know, I'm not really totally familiar with how these platforms work. Um, that's the best platform. That's the way you were able to uh, connect with me. And uh, if they utilize that platform, I think that would be the best way to do it. There it is. There it is. Uh, if you are not inspired, you got to check your heart rate, check, make sure it's still beating, make sure you're still breathing because I don't know what's going on, man. Cause I'm ready to take over the world right now. Talking to John, man. So I appreciate everybody for listening. This is definitely one to share and to let people know about what, what this history is. And every time you hear, you know, a, a siren, you should be thinking about Freedom House. Every time you see a medic, you should be thinking about Freedom House. Every time, you know, paramedic is even mentioned, you should be thinking about Freedom House. Um, share the work. Uh, definitely try to, you know, read the books and get the information so we can pass on the information and keep the Freedom House name alive. And of course, remember, your mind is the most powerful tool in the universe. If you can think it, you can do it. If you believe in it, you can be it. And if you fight for it, you can have it. The world is yours. This has been your host, Mr. G, and I'll see you next time on Mastermind. Uh, so every day I'm going hard. I'm talking business, bank accounts, and credit cards. And somehow we defeat the odds and making sure that no one starves illegal or you had it.